day, everybody, and welcome to Nerd Talk. I'm John. And I'm Jake. Fantastic. Today we're coming to you with the season finale of, of Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Uh, we've had a real bang-up season here, 10 episodes in, and uh, it keeps getting better and better, in, in, my, in my opinion. Uh, we're coming to you tonight with episode 10, entitled A Quality of Mercy. This was directed by Chris Fisher, uh, written by the executive producer Henry Alazano Myers, and co-written by co-executive producer Akiva Goldsman, based, as always, upon Star Trek created by Gene Roddenberry. Uh, looking briefly at the numbers, last week our episode came in at 51 minutes and 31 seconds. This week we had the longest episode to date, one hour, one minute, and 27 seconds uh, if we time it to the fade to black at the end. Now, normally, I would do the starring uh, at this point, and we'd move mm -hmm. forward. We're not going to do that quite yet. We're going to go ahead and hit our uh, kind of non-spoilery uh, feelings and thoughts upon this episode first. And then once we've gone through that, then we'll come back and get into who is on the episode. So we're going to start <laughs> with... Uh, with Jake, Jake, what 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 were your thoughts on this episode? Um, so I'm gonna say up front, this episode is not what I expected as the season finale from a show that has challenged us each episode. Okay. In retrospect of watching the episode, I understand why it fits and why it works really well. It just completely caught me off guard. Sure. And I think it was a story told from, I think, three very unique perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, and a story that makes us understand why self-sacrifice sometimes is warranted, uh, even though you have an option of not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I very much agree. Uh, you know, it, a credible Star Trek source uh, that, that that handles publicity and a lot of the interviews and uh, news and stories back uh, Friday, I believe it was, came out with a tweet s urging everyone to not watch any of the previews for the episode as frequently on Mondays, Paramount does put out still photos and a brief overview of the episode and they, they made it very clear that unlike normal they they urged everyone to stay as far away from possible uh which i was i was quite surprised as were the hundreds upon hundreds of comments on the tweet as to wait i what are you what are you getting into here because they clearly <laughs> when they showed a clip uh last week at the end of the ready room it really didn't give you very much context as to the episode itself. Uh, there were a couple of things in it that, in hindsight, I should have noticed and should have picked up on. Uh, most notably, uh, the emblem on uh, the the uh, the one person's uniform. Uh, but beyond that, I didn't I didn't catch anything else. And well, and I and, agree, and John. Like any if they anything else that would have come from the episode would have tipped their hand i can yeah. completely oh yeah like the the preview we got in ready room last week was about the only content from the episode that while if you were really paying attention you would know what was going on but otherwise it was the only thing that you could show and be like okay it's an episode yeah fine no, and not absolutely. have the hand tipped every other like frame probably of the episode would have tipped sure because you and I, I was texting you while I was watching it, right? Mm -hmm. And what? I was like maybe six minutes in when I started going, oh, I know what they're doing. <laughs> like it was already a wild four minutes in. But by like six, I'm like, I know what they did there. Holy, insert lots of colorful metaphors. <laughs> agreed, agreed. And it, yeah, and, and it... it uh... Most episodes, even if you were to have something like like that transpire, where you go, "Oh wow," the, you, there's a little bit of a uh, a little bit of a lull, a little bit of a chance for you to catch up. Now, this episode pretty much kept you right at that edge, 
the entire time. And uh, yeah, it, it was amazing. So we're going to go heading right into it at this point and talking about the episode. Uh, if you haven't watched the episode yet, this is this is your last spoiler warning. This is this is it. You need to go watch the episode before you come back. And uh, as as an extra side note, again, we certainly would like for you to come back and watch this. We don't want you to be spoiled by anything. We don't want you to be confused by anything you're seeing. So go watch the episode. And if you decide to take the extra time, I can recommend that if you go back uh, to Star Trek, the original series, uh, season one, I believe it's episode 15, depending on who you look at. Sometimes IMDb shows it as 16. Paramount Plus shows it as 15. But if you go back and watch, there is an episode called Balance of Terror. I won't explain why. Go watch it. Go watch the new episode. And then come back and join the discussion with us. All right. Spoiler. Or if you've just decided you like to do things backwards, you know, that's fine with me as well. So at this point, I am going to go through our list of, of cast this week as, as it has been all season. Uh, it stars Anson Mount, Ethan Peck, Rebecca Romaine, Jess Bush, Christina Chong, uh, Celia Rose Gooden, Gooding, uh, Melissa Navia, Babs Alusamuku, and if we could all take just a moment of silence for Bruce Warwick. Not for the actor, but for the character. Wait. <laughs> was he in this episode? He was not in this episode, but he's still oh. in the credits. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that there was actually just a um, an interview with uh, the executive producer uh, a couple of days, like literally just a couple of days ago on a podcast that um, is, is done by the gentleman. Uh, his name is all of a sudden escaping me, but uh, there's a podcast uh, that is being done by the gentleman who played Jake Sisko. Uh, it used to be done. Sirach uh, Lofton. Thank you. Thank you. I, there we go. So he, he was actually doing an interview and he talked about uh, that episode and that character and asked uh, if this was the end, because he had heard something about Bruce Horrock saying that he wasn't done in the Star Trek universe. And the executive producer said that he wouldn't talk about it. However, in uh, in all of the Star Trek uh, series is at one time or another, you've had an actor who has played multiple characters. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, going back to Mark Leonard, who played Sarek and the Romulan commander in Balance of Terror. Which, by the way, episode mm. fourteen is what I'm 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 seeing. Uh, it would, that, that was the I, and I'm mistaken how I said that. It's episode fourteen, but um, for Combs, uh, Sirach Lofton said something to him and said, "Do you mean kind of like with 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 my Star Trek with with my with uh, Jeffrey Combs with Jeffrey Combs who played almost every role on Star Trek at one time or another." And, and has, I believe, the distinction of being the only character actor to portray two unrelated, not mirror universe, I, two unrelated characters in the same episode. Episode. <laughs> Literally plays both two different characters in an episode. He is Weyoun and Brunt in DS9, and there is a DS9 episode that both show up at the station at the same time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So, I don't and... think he has to talk to himself, though. That would have no, been I don't, I don't think he actually had that happen. Unlike this episode, but um, <laughs> but uh, the the executive producer said yes, exactly like Jeffrey Combs. Uh, it's isn't Ooh. it wonderful when we have actors who play in a certain amount of prosthetics and makeup who then can be shown in either other prosthetics and makeup or just none at all and be a completely different character and yeah. uh, basically tipping the hand that 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 the actor is definitely going to have a part in this next season, which I, I think is is fantastic. I think it's wonderful, much like Discovery when they when they did this uh, with uh, uh, Aram, Arium, uh, the, the character that was, mm -hmm. that was cy uh, cyborg, uh, when the actress couldn't continue playing the character because of the prosthetics and the, rea the reaction her skin was having, they just shifted her to become a different character and, and mm -hmm. cast yep. somebody else in that role. So the, the new Trek has a, a habit of doing this that I really, really enjoy. Let's not forget, though, with the, with the, uh, the starring characters in this episode, we have Jan, Dan Gillette, uh, Dan Janot uh, playing Sam Kirk again this week. 
Andre de Kim, who does come back as Chief Kyle and, and actually gets just a few moments of screen time. And we also have another surprise uh, guest star as uh, as we uh, we knew it was coming. It's something that they certainly haven't uh, haven't made any any uh, any effort to really try to hide too much. Uh, but this this week uh, we do have James T. Kirk showing up for the first time. Um, it it, uh, it it was something we were wondering about and uh, wondering how it was going to happen. But he is played by Paul mm -hmm. Wesley in this episode, and so it was it was quite interesting to get to see him. So we're going to start with the first. So real second. quick, sure, John, did they give uh, credit for the voice of Scotty? They did not. I have yet to see it. In fact, the IMDb page has not been updated since prior to the episode being put out. Uh, there are several characters that just are wondering if they took their hat all, as or... to whether or not we're going to see him back next season and who right. is playing him. Uh, yeah, I think it was uh, that was an inspired moment to throw that in the way that they did. Mm -hmm. I think that worked even better than if they had tried to jam in too many people that you yes. see in screen on the same episode. But yeah, worked beautifully on this one. Uh, so we're going to start with with section one with John. One. Yes, sir. Did you forget the giant spoiler? I don't know. Denise Crosby. Denise Crosby is not in this episode, sir. She was the predator. According to whom? Her face? Am I am I, I don't completely think that off was base her. here? I don't that, think that was her. Yeah, no. It would have uh, been a lovely little little Easter egg because, that's why she, I because thought. of Sela. She jumped Sela. on screen and I thought No, I don't think that was her. No, but I've seen her in I mean, person. I was excited because I recognized Wait. something, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was like, oh, it's yeah. Tasha Yar. I mean, Sila. I mean, neither of them because they don't exist yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. I, she does have very similar facial structure. Yeah, so I will, that's I will why. Say, that would be easy to, to, to misinterpret. But no, I, I don't think so. But uh, again, mm -hmm. I so far IMDb has not caught up, which is surprising. Normally they they have these things uh, right in the time. I had to go yeah. look for a couple of the people that showed up because they just weren't listed yet. But uh, so we're going to begin with with Act 1. We open on Captain's Log, Stardate 1457.9. And we find that the Enterprise and the Cayuga are on the edge of Federation space near the Romulan neutral zone. Uh, Pike makes some comment about how there's been a war for nearly 100 years, mostly a Cold War, uh, until very recently, and uh, uh, reiterates that, that nobody has seen the Romulans, nobody knows anything about them. Uh, the two ships are there helping to, with retrofitting and supplies, uh, although those retrofits and supplies are not as tasty as, as pasta mala, which we find out is a very, very easy dish of leftover pasta, eggs, uh, grated Parmesan, Parmesan cheese, and... Uh, and, it, and it makes for a fun time. Uh, we have Captain Patel back. We've been we've been making that comment since the very first episode that we were hoping we would see her again, and we do. Um, a fun little little play between the two of them to start the episode. Uh, she's back, and she misses the beard. And he he talks about the fact that he felt that the beard was kind of more of a throwback to captains of another era. She makes a comment: "Aren't you supposed to be a captain out of time anyway?" Fun little uh, little little fourth wall break to, to throw in prior to the episode really happening. Uh, he he says, you know, I had somebody tell me that I had better places to be, and now I'm here, which was a, a nice little callback to her her monologue to him at the at the beginning of the series. Um, they end up meeting with uh, the outpost commanders, who whose name is Hanson, and Hanson's son. Uh, Pike that realizes that this is a boy who, in seven years, is going to be a Starfleet cadet and is going to be one of two Starfleet cadets that he is unable to save during the horrible accident that's going to disfigure him and um, and and change his life forever. Uh, they they have a, a brief back and forth. However, he kind of scoots out of the room very quickly, which is very uncharacteristic for him. He, he says he needs to, he's not feeling well, needs to leave for a moment. He goes back to his quarters and he gets to those quarters and then ends up having a chat with himself. 
And um, I don't mean just talking to himself, although he tries to say that to somebody else. I love that line. It was a lovely line. <laughs> yeah, he gets to talk not only to himself, but he th they get to talk about his first horse, whose name was Sir Nasalot. I love it. Uh, from there, he touches a time crystal, and he is suddenly in a cargo bay conducting a very, very familiar wedding to everybody here except for Jake. Uh, and at some point, you'll, you'll, you'll catch up to speed on this. Um, what I'm hinting to, just to break out of this for just a moment, is that this entire episode is a retelling in a one of the most creative ways that I can think of of a of a story from the original mm -hmm. series. And some it, of the few pieces of toss I've seen is this. Yeah. Well, so as soon as it started, I was like, I recognize these things. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> and and it is well yeah, insert Captain America that. gift right here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and and real quick. This is Star Trek, just to start the wheel of uh, tropes. Star Trek <laughs> does an episode of Marvel One. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's what we get. Like, uh, Star Trek doesn't tend to do a lot of what ifs. They have done some, but they don't do it nearly as much as, like, comic books do. But this, we start off with basically what if. It's exactly what it is. It, it, and, but they handle it in, in kind of a fresh way that I really, I mean, that. It, I've never seen an episode that is basically a, a retread of an episode, but handled in such an original and interesting way that I totally, totally dug it. Anyway. Perhaps you haven't seen Trials and Tribulations. Oh, no, no. That's that's the other one that they've done. <laughs> yeah, no, no. That's that's a little different. That one Sorry, I have to defend me. DS9. I have to <laughs> defend DS9. It's oh, my fave. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's mine as well. So uh, he's conducting this very familiar wedding, except for he can't remember anybody's names. Uh, the ship goes to Red Alert. Thank God. I've never heard a captain say thank God for, <laughs> for going to Red Alert before. Saved but... by the klaxon. It's saved exactly. by the klaxon. We find out that, that Outpost 4 is under attack. Uh, again, all very familiar. Pike finds that he is seven years in the future. Uh, Spock is his number one now, his first officer. They have a chat in uh, the ready room. And uh, Spock mind melds with him to verify his story that he is out of time. Uh, they find uh, that this is obviously true and that, that, uh, that this is a road not taken, that this is an alternate version of how things could happen in the future. They go back to the bridge, and uh, unfortunately, the ship is there but not there fast enough to be able to save Hansen and Outpost 4 from a Romulan bird of prey attack uh, with its new plasma weapon. Uh, there is a new contact on sensors. It's the USS Farragut that drops out of warp. And we find out that this is now the ship that La'an is posted to. Uh, and then with that, we're going to end our first act, and we're going to go to Jay for his comments on this. So, um, like I said in the pre-spoiler stuff, uh, you know, I got about three or four minutes in and went, oh, oh, ooh. Pike, alt, future Pike shows up in Monster Maroons. Oh, wow. Yes. So, like... Alternate I Monster do Maroon, wanna... but still... Yeah, on... They look beautiful. Yeah. However, I am going to just take 30 seconds and I have to look. I'm talking to you, <laughs> production team over at New Trek. Please, please stop putting the Delta in like whatever that pattern material is that makes it impossible for us cosplayers to reproduce the costumes. Just stop with it. The, the Monster Maroon was beautiful. What you produced was beautiful. And then I just the floor fell out from underneath me when I when we got a close enough camera angle to see that same pattern down the sleeve. Please don't do that. Just stop. It's okay. Um, but it was beautiful. Like that aside, it was beautiful. It so elegantly grounds us to how far in the future Pike is coming from. Mm -hmm. Did you notice he wore the Admiral Clover? Yes, I saw that. Right? They like down to the ranks from the motion from the film era of Toss. Loved it. Um, and what a what a setup! What a setup for an episode. Um, there are uh, there are other characters that I think their future selves could have just said, "You can't do this. It's bad." Um, I know you want to, but please don't. It's a bad idea. And they would have been like, "Okay, I guess I'll do that." Like, I didn't carry Kim, right? 
he actually has an yeah. episode where he has to tell him his past self by a seven. Don't do that. And he doesn't. And he doesn't. He just doesn't do it. But Pike, in an interesting contrast to Kirk, or kind of a, a comparison contrast, Pike also doesn't like to lose, but it's not in the same kind of rebellious way. It's in the I'm going to be clever way. I'm going to, yeah. I'm just going to be me way, which. And, and realize, and he realizes like the, the future Pike is like, I'm going to have to send you into the future and let you, let you deal with it. Let you experience my stuff. And maybe that will be enough for you well, to change your mind. We've seen for an entire season, Pike trying to think his way out of his fate. Yeah. Uh, he, he is, has not convinced himself that he needs to, because there have been points during the season where he said, this is what it is. And if I can do something that's going to save everybody else, so be it. But um, yep. by that same token, he is constantly trying to think himself out. So he knows as his older well, self. And, and Una is not helping. Una is not helping that no. acceptance. Right. No. Um, so I really appreciated the setup like that business. It's so true to Pike. Um, it was just really elegantly handled. The time crystals is a nice callback to how we got here in the first place. And then you've already talked about how uh, we start into balance of terror. What if, and it's just, but they handle it marvelously. I was, I'm going to end it here. I was reminded when he shows up, of all good things and Picard same kind of like disassociation with reality yep. because of all the time jumping when he appears in places for the first time, especially like, when am I, what's going on here? Even if he had done it before, like he right. shows up on in the past on the accepting command of the enterprise and Picard's like, I, what? Uh -huh. what? <laughs> well, so I, I, I like how this they, episode they handled that, that because they, they, I mean, they, that, that could have been officially handled with the wedding and then talking to Spock, but they continued it. He's getting more acclimated and he's allowing more of it to just kind of continue. But then, Oh, lawn ship. Oh, I forgot. Clearly something yeah. he wouldn't have done, but yeah, I, I love how they, how they, how they kind of moved ahead with that. So we're going to go ahead if it's all right with everybody and get into act two. So act two it is James T. Kirk of the USS Farragut here to help, and um, I wasn't I wasn't sure how I felt. I, w I wanted to give uh, it's no secret they've been talking about this for a while that he was going to be coming to the show. They they were very cagey about how and when and and why, but it was known that it was going to be happening. And in fact, now on thinking back on it, um, they've shown him in two different uniforms, or at least with two different insignias. So um, it's understandable that there may be maybe something different now going back for the second season when he when he will show up again. But he shows up. Spock determines that the ship that has attacked them probably can't see while being cloaked. They've determined that uh, when it decloaks, it can see what's going on, fire a weapon and then recloaks and is probably just as blind as uh, it's it's made itself being cloaked it itself can't see out while it's cloaked. Um, at this point, if you haven't watched Balance of Terror, the original series episode, please go back and watch that. It makes a big difference on this. Uh, Sam and Pike have a little quick uh, meeting in the in the um, uh, ready room. Uh, Sam says Jim is impulsive, but he is one of the best captains out there, and they agree on 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 that at least from from this point. Back on the bridge, they get a view of the new of this Romulan war, uh, bird of prey. Uh, and they actually get a shot of the bridge of the Romulan Bird of Prey. And, again, it was obvious it was coming, but we have found out that after 100 years of not having any idea who these people were, they look just like Vulcans. And that was a, a fun little uh, you know, comparison to, to how uh, the original series handled the same thing. Kirk beams over uh, to the Enterprise and meets everyone, and they get to discuss things uh, briefly on what they want to do. Everybody, including Kirk, wants to go on the offensive. Pike is the only one that's a holdout, saying, I'd like to find a diplomatic solution first. 
Uh, Jim points out that they could probably, you know, find a way to, to sort of do both. Uh, he notes that there is a comet nearby and that if they follow and, and, and go into the tail of the comet, they'll probably be able to see the bird of prey coming. Unfortunately, they attempt this, but the bird of prey attacks instead and renders the Farragut pretty much ruined and destroyed. Uh, they beam the survivors back over to the Enterprise. Uh, La'an gets to hug Pike. We find out that she's apparently a hugger now. And we find out that Una is not available to assist Pike or anyone else for that matter. And she's not allowed outside contact. They haven't exactly fully explained, but we'll get into it later. Jim Kirk argues with Pike uh, and his option of caution, but that they agree that Kirk takes chances. And it's obvious that he does, as he is now talking about it while standing on the ship uh, that he was not in command of since his command is gone now. Uh, that was a fun little go-between with the two of them. Uh, not mm -hmm. adversarial, but not buddy-buddy yet. Uh, anyway, they hail the Romulans. The Romulans actually answer, which everyone was surprised with. They have a very familiar exchange and agree to a two-hour ceasefire in order to let them uh, repair their ships and bury their dead. On the Bird of Prey, you find out that the commander and the sub-commander very clearly do not see eye-to-eye -eye on things whatsoever. Back on the ship, Pike, Kirk, and Spock meet in the ready room for the first time. Kirk asks if he can get a shuttle to bring in some outside help. And with that, we're going to shift over to Jake. This is the end of that act. What were your thoughts on this act, Jake? Well, first, I like the idea of let's let it waft through a comet's tail and we'll see it and then shoot them. Um, I like this introduction to Captain Kirk. This is a very different Captain Kirk. And it's also not lost on me that if you look at Old Pike, and I don't mean Old Pike in S SMW, I mean Old Pike from the cage. Mm -hmm. This dude looks like Old Pike. A little bit. Um, I like getting this glimpse into the inner workings of a Romulan ship. I'm assuming we've had that somewhere in Star Trek history. I've never had that somewhere in Star Trek history. <laughs> Um, so I think it's really cool to see how they interact. Um, it's very much, they're a lot more Klingon than they want to be. I think. Yeah, I get that. Uh, they're a little more Klingon than they want to let on. Um, well, and you, it's funny you say that. There really haven't been. The Romulans are one of the few of the major races that we really haven't seen too much of their technology or their ships. Uh, I will say, though, if you go back and look at Balance of Terror, they did such a fantastic job of updating the, mm -hmm. the bridge or command center to give it that very, very same feel, yet make it a lot more believable for the time mm -hmm. period. I, I agree. Um, I also like how you've got the entire staff saying, let's just kill them, <laughs> which I'm fairly certain was what happened in the original Imbalance of Terror, yes. correct? Yes, that is um, that. That is the whole point: is that Pike was not the right captain for the job. Yeah, in fact, um, some of the lines are actually verbatim. Uh, a couple of Spock's lines and a couple of the other characters' lines are mm -hmm. literally. Verbatim. I got that feel, mm -hmm. um, and I, like I said, I've seen that episode. It's probably been fifteen years, and I've recognized some of the stuff. And some of the stuff we were talking about off camera on our Discord about the shadows and the imagery. I feel that because I remember those shots. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I've really much, very, very much enjoyed the sequence. Um, I like how they basically looked at Spock and were like, "Lucy, you got some explaining to do." <laughs> because yeah, I would immediately be like, "What the hell? These are like Vulcan cousins." So well, and in his the explanation series, that was it was a point of. Um, very blatant racism from at least a couple of the the mm -hmm. non-regular ship members uh right. this was this was very much done specifically to be a shock to the viewers of that original series and and try to bring into question and the moral um issues that come about by having people that look similar to others and and what that what that can mean right and that makes sense i mean it really does and that's 
the kind of moral questions this series has been asking since episode one. Mm-hmm. So I liked it. Um, I need more of this Kirk to really get a feel for how I like him or not. Agreed. So I'm ready for season two. They've already said that his character is going to be in season two. Um, and at the time, again, they were quite cagey about it. But obviously at this point, uh, I think they... I don't remember if Pike actually says something about it, but you see him checking out the command fire, the, the 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 officer profile of Jim Kirk at the end of the episode. So it's it's clear that they're he he. I have a feeling he has decided he wants to either mentor this guy or or become friends with him. You, there's something that's going to be there uh, in this next season. I think that'll be quite a bit of fun because I John, I like it. I I wonder in like I, it just popped in my head i wonder if what he's doing is grooming him for command of the enterprise specifically because he knows that he, that, that kirk had the right answer i think you're right that no, he I, needs I that. that that kirk has to be the one in command of enterprise when the timeline plays out to get to the place that he should have been and so if he i wonder if he's not playing chess mm-hmm. to get him to be the natural replacement god that's when just, the accident happens what a great idea i mean what uh, oh, i hope that's what they're going to be doing because it does it fits his profile perfectly yep now hmm. that he knows what he has to do he's going to do it it's the guy who knows okay i can't actually control this thing that's going to happen so i'm going to control everything that happens around it. Mm-hmm. yep All right, so let's move on. Uh, and uh, also, this is actually, let's not move on because I have one last thing to say. At this point, th- this was, uh, I took a step back when we got to this alternate timeline and started really looking at how things were. And if you notice, so much changed around the ship. Uh, there were... There was a pad on on uh, Pike's desk that looked like the original series pad, which mm, they'd already done that, right. but they made it look even more so. There was a yep. one of those blocky square view screens on the corner of his desk, just like Kirk had had in his quarters, and and were all over the ship in different places. Uh, so they 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 definitely took their time, and even cinematically, you know, when you when you look at not only did some of these scenes become shot by shot uh, recreations of scenes from the original series and verbatim dialogue uh, coming in. But they also were affecting the the shots and the angles that were being used. They weren't using some of the same camera techniques that they normally use. They were using lighting that that put the 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 highlight across the eyes on the bridge, which was something that was frequently done in the original series. It was just really interesting. If you go back and look at it objectively, not try to follow the story, just watch the background. Amazing. Some of the stuff that they did that, that really made you feel like you were back in the original series to a certain extent. Anyway, now we're going to move along to the third act. So at this point, Spock uh, lets Pike know that he needs to go. He wants to, to oversee the repairs to the phaser directly himself. Uh, while peace is being brokered on the bridge with the Romulan commander, the Romulan fleet arrives. Thanks to the sub-commander who was not getting along with his, his commander, the praetor of the Romulan fleet shows up, uh, asks the Enterprise and Pike to kneel and surrender. Pike won't do either one of them, fortunately. Suddenly, a Federation fleet of robotic mining craft show up with Kirk in a shuttlecraft. He had gone and pulled this entire fleet to even the odds. And this is a classic Jim Kirk thing. He noodled through that uh, if we didn't know what the Romulan fleet looked like after 100 years, they don't know what our fleet looks like either. They have no idea what we have. So hopefully we could even the odds a bit. Uh, Pike proves that there is video showing the bird of prey attacking an outpost, shows it to the Praetor, who doesn't seem to care about that much at all. Uh, The bird of prey that was first encountered advances closer to them than the rest of the Romulan fleet. And with that... After a, uh, a, a little monologue from the, the Romulan commander uh, saying that he and Pike could have been friends in another time, uh, the Romulan fleet destroys the bird of prey. Uh, the Praetor comes back on screen, 
And basically at this point, hostilities ensue. A, a firefight starts up. Enterprise gets the heck out of town, only to find uh, that a declaration of war has been issued. So this Cold War has now turned hot, thanks to the, the situation that's occurred over here over the last day. Pike goes to sick bay to, to tour sick bay and the injured, finds out that Spock is wounded and will not recover. Uh, Pike meets back again with his older self, uh, finding out that the war turned hot and that millions had been lost in the ensuing years instead of Pike. On the bridge, uh, all is, seems to be well. Everybody uh, kind of seems to be settling down and, and, and getting comfortable in their chairs until Captain Battelle comes back. We get to the transporter room, and she advises that under Starfleet Code of Contact 587.63, uh, pertaining to the Anti-Genetic Modification Directive, she is there to arrest Una Chen Riley, even though she isn't real happy with it. Pike is also not happy with it and stares directly at the screen as we fade to black. So we're going to go back to Jay for this third act. Uh, this was uh, this was quite a thing. It was. It was. So um, we alluded earlier post-spoilers to Scotty's voice. So mm -hmm. we have another one, wonderful scene in Jeffrey's tube that's very evocative of stuff from Toss. Uh -huh. In fact, I think from this specific episode, yep. we have Spock doing the repairs, supervising and actually hands-on in the Jeffrey's tube. And you just know, like the moment that hit, it's like, that's not foreshadowing at all. Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, um, it was nice to hear Scotty's voice. Mm -hmm. Um, this whole business that that is set up here in the third act that Pike can't have his cake and eat it too, right? Mm -hmm. He can be successful and save himself, but the trade is always Spock. Like, there mm -hmm. is this business about what Monster Maroons Pike says that you. I almost wonder how many times has he had to try this? Like, how many times has he come back and be like, don't do it. And so they do something else and right. it still ends poorly. Right. How many times, because he talked about earlier in the episode about how, Oh yeah, I remember what it was like when this happened to me. And it's like, but you're here to prevent the whole thing. So if you've gone through the whole cycle, Oh, wait a minute, this didn't work the first time. Did it? <laughs> right. Yep. I think that's what we're looking at. Um, and that it's always Spock was my read on it. And this business about the role Spock plays. Of course, we all know. We're fans. We've seen the timeline play out. We know what is to come. All the way up through unification in Next Generation. And the setting up of what that gives us for um, the, the final unification that happens in where we, that we had happened by the time Discovery gets into the distant future. Um, not to mention all the other roles that Spock plays in things like the whales and the probe, right? Um, and honestly, undiscovered go country. back and go back like to the, the menagerie. All of a sudden, yeah. everything that happened in that episode makes so much more sense. This added the 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 piece of information that we've never had and didn't realize we needed to have to understand why Spock felt that way toward his captain. And now- Oh, now the, totally the dialogue about, I feel like I owe you something great and I will never understand why. Like it was the perfect setup for uh, for the menagerie, absolutely. Uh -huh. So does, does Pike not getting radiated domino down the line and erase the Kelvin timeline? Ooh. It could. That's and notice there was there was there was a shout out this week. There was a connection there, because Kirk says that he grew up in in, in Iowa, yes. and that his father was the first officer on the Kelvin on the USS yes. Kelvin. Yep, that was a great little drop. Little name yeah, drop. I uh, but I it also cuts away. Just, it does. Sorry. You don't hear the rest of it. Yeah, he no, says, it's... but then he went on to, and then it cuts away. Yep. So that's a that is a good point. Um. So the the whole thing is just this beautiful package of a Star Trek what if scenario, especially as we hit the ending. 
Pike kind of comes and settles himself uh, to accept his fate. Spock and he have that really touching moment. And then in what has become classic for Strange New Worlds, we set up this wonderful reversal. And I don't mean wonderful in it, it was happy, just this unexpected reversal of fortune right at the end. Because we get about a minute and a half or two minutes of Pike settling in, right? And he has this lovely tour of the bridge, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? These silent moments with Una, with um, Ortega's, and just with his bridge and his ship and his crew. And like, I was like, cool, what a way to end the first season. Yeah, the, the only perfect amount was of Una kind of looked around at everybody a little strange, like yeah, she knew but, something was about to happen. But, but still, like for the most part, just this lovely thing. They oh, let and the it music go for like two was, beats was fantastic. The the classic song. Speaking played. of the music, did you catch that we used Balance of Terror music uh -huh. during the parts in the, the future? The Romulan, the Romulan fanfare came through. Oh, oh there's so anyway. much in this episode that that harkens back. They moved a horror station to directly behind yep. the captain which yep. is where she was in the balance of terror in the original and, episode. Yep. And then they let it play out for two beats, which mm -hmm. was the perfect amount of time. Like where you're expecting, we're about to go to fade to black. We're going to hold it just long enough. And then the reversal starts and we go to the transporter room. And I was excited to see the tech our, come back. our, Patel come back at the beginning of the episode and I was even kind of like, oh, look at Patel. Why is she with red shirts? What is going on? Look, we're already here. And now we know why number one is not in the future. And then the fade to black. Like, I think that that reversal fit very nicely with the things they've done all season long. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just like full of master strokes I and mean, just all 10 episodes this they was hit. this i, this I, was I mean, a i'm satisfying just gonna jump straight to, that was capped yes. off by an amazingly satisfying ending <laughs> yes all the way up to those last moments where you you thought it was fine and then they take the rug a little out from underneath you you don't fall over completely but you stumble and you're like but but what? Not the the rug yank that Best of Both Worlds was. No, no. But still, or even or even a number of the other sure. two parters that we had throughout post Best of Both Worlds. Yeah, but but enough. Like it it, it was the right. It, it felt like the right amount. Like I'm just, just like anyway. you. I was thinking, hey, this is interesting. We're going to end on a non cliffhanger. That's so unusual for us these days. Oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, and and i'm just i i feel like this is a point where i have to just say at least one thing about the season as a whole that the, the sure. just big thoughts gentlemen we just had the freshman season of a star trek series that went that batted 1000 now would i rather we batted a thousand over 20 some episodes absolutely but 10 out of 10 i i, I don't know that there's any other nearly perfect season of any trek out there sixth seventh or or not let alone freshman where every series in their freshman year has huge bumps in the road like huge huge yeah. missteps 10 out of 10 solid amazing episodes and to think as much am... as we saw the crew and the cast gelling that was another thing said in the ready room was they didn't get to spend any time together. The executive producer of the show didn't get to come to the set until the last episode of the season. He did everything from Zoom because this was this this entire first season was shot prior to the uh, the the vaccine coming out, so they couldn't have Whoa. anybody there at all. Yep, that's crazy. yeah. They were full COVID. They were full COVID protocols for this. Yeah. So I just can't already... wait to see what they do with season two. Oh like, my god! Season like... two now that they're actually all going to be allowed because, you know, they were saying they weren't allowed to associate with each other off the set at all. They weren't able to to be anywhere near each other. Um, most of them barely got to meet each other during the first season, except for in scenes that they had together. So, 
Oh. So yeah, season two is gonna is gonna be absolutely bonkers when it comes to that. I can't. I just like. Do we know and, when? And early in the year. They, it's not gonna take very long because they've already finished filming. So they just ready. finished. They just wrapped filming a few days ago. I saw the message. Let's go edit, 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 Paramount. Let's go. Yeah, they, <laughs> I think the the current was first month or so of 2023 cool i'm good with that i do not need to wait an entire year thank you very much no no absolutely i i i think we're gonna to see even more um this this has worked out so well thus far and um i just i there's so much that i enjoyed about this episode and um how reverential they were being to the source material that they were pulling from, but going their own own way a little bit on it and and coming up with some very, very interesting ideas and, and, and choices on things that I thought really kind of hit hit it out of the park. And just like the rest of the season, it's it's been it's been a heck of a ride and I've enjoyed it. Um so I want to say and I'm gonna go back to the very beginning. Sure. Um I when the voice first started when Pike walked into his um uh, mm. his quarters before I knew who it was, and we talked about this off camera, but I didn't mention, I thought they had digitized Leonard Nemo. Oh. And I was like, oh, God, please don't. Please don't. Yeah. But this I is so much that. better. Mm-hmm. This is so, so, so much better. Agreed. Well, I hope everybody yeah. out there enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, in closing thoughts, uh, just a couple, and I'll let everybody get their little moment in. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, this week we have uh, another uh, in memoriam, another passing uh, to discuss. This one is a little bit more obscure for some uh, fans of Trek, but Dorothy Duder, who is the wife of Doug Drexler, we've mentioned him time and time again. He has worked in everything from uh, from makeup and uh, makeup design. Uh, early on in Next Generation through to uh, production design, digital design, not only for Star Trek, but for many other uh, series as well. He, he, his wife um, unfortunately lost a one-year battle with cancer uh, this last week. She uh, was also a member of the Trek family in her own right. Uh, she helped out quite a bit through, uh, through Deep Space Nine and... Um, uh, and, and had worked in, in many other uh, positions in Hollywood already. By the time Star Trek Enterprise came around, she became kind of the, the Enterprise's chef. Anytime they needed food on the set, she would come in and bake for them and cook for them. Uh, in fact, he has just been recently putting together a, a, a cookbook for her of, of recipes that she came up with to not only have food on set, but also to have food that was stylized, the way they wanted it to based on the timeline. Uh, and so she, that, that's a, that's a, a pretty big thing. Uh, and it, it's a pretty big loss. Uh, Doug has gone through uh, some health issues of his own recently. And uh, this was something that a lot of people did not realize uh, was a concern. Uh, they were being very private about it, understandably. Uh, but uh, apparently uh, she passed this last week and um, you know, Doug, We'll never probably see this show. I've met him once in person and have had some some exchanges with him online and and know some people that also know him. But uh, Doug is just an amazing man. And uh, Dorothy was also uh, an amazing woman. And she will absolutely be missed. If you've checked out any Star Trek tweets or uh, comments on Facebook lately, uh, they have been flooding the Internet with well wishes for him and condolences and a celebration of her life. So thought it was worth mentioning this week. Wow. I, I'm, I'm going to say something completely out of turn and I expect editing to bleep me out, but fuck cancer. I've just, I like, nope. the, it, yeah, that it, doesn't we keep getting this to, nope. fair enough. I'm sorry, but like we, we lost Renee Obanjaris to mm. cancer again in a surprising way where he had been very private about it just a couple of years ago. Um, we just keep losing people to this. Um, and yeah. it is awful when it happens, especially the unseen misery. I was at a con, I was at two cons in, in the last year that Rene was before he passed away. And I saw him speak in public twice. And on one of those, 
he was on his back on the floor of the platform because he didn't feel well enough to sit up, but he still did the panel with us and just said, I was, he was like, I just, I'm feeling a little under the weather. Turns out he was having a bad cancer day, which oh. like that's, oh, just, ugh. so yeah. no, absolutely. I'm, 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 I'm quite honestly mad to hear it. Like I'm saddened too, but I'm feeling a little feisty about it because it's just oh, not I am fair. Too. No, I am as well. Uh, you know, that, I have followed them for 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 many years, even before I I got a chance to to meet Mr. Drexler, and we the community as a large as a whole was very concerned. He was having uh, uh, very early stage prostate cancer and was having uh, some some surgery done very quickly because uh, this was this was a concern his doctor had, and so very very quickly he was out of public eye for a couple of weeks. wasn't showing up on Facebook. wasn't doing anything. We knew he had gotten through the procedure and was recuperating. Then to get this was just an absolute gut punch, knowing that the two of them were dealing with this at exactly the same time together. But their oh. grace and and their uh, you know their love for each other is just amazing. He's been posting pictures on his Facebook page uh, for the last week, d all day, every day, and mm -hmm. it's it is heartbreaking. Good, good of him. Like but, I'm glad that he's I'm glad he's sell that there is a piece of this is where he is celebrating the memory oh, like it's he got to be awful and the amount I of behind the scenes he... video and photos of the star trek art department getting together in 1991 that he's that he's posting online that nobody would have ever seen uh i just uh it 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 was a gut punch for me and uh i, I read several comments that were like i'm sitting here trying to explain to my family why i'm in tears uh, and I'm thinking to myself, well, right there with you, dude, because <laughs> because because I am myself. I never met her and I, I'm I'm the worst off for it. I think uh, she she was an amazing person from what I saw. And uh, our condolences certainly go out to him and his family and and all of their friends. He and and Dorothy were very, very are very, very close friends with Mike and Denise Akuda. Uh, we found out that Denise Akuda and and Mike have spent uh, a significant portion of the last two or three weeks at their house, helping make her comfortable in her final days and being there with her. And it just, I mean, they say Star Trek is a family and oh, yeah. I, it's stuff like that, that I think really shows that it's not just lip service. No, no, so. absolutely. So sorry to end on that. Um, uh, either of you have any other final thoughts for the, for the ser season or for the series as a whole so far? I'm going to let Jay go first. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I already said my I already said my piece that strange for Str Stranger Worlds, the only series in my opinion that had a, a batting a thousand freshman season. Mm -hmm. um, wow, uh, I I think I uh, am fully on board with Pike being one of my all time favorite captains, if not my absolute favorite now. Uh, thank you, Anson Mount, for that, um, and thank you for the production team for that. Um, I, and I'm just digging the whole cast and the whole show. Like, I just can't wait. Like, in a way where with some of the other new Trek, I have not been as excited to see what they were going to do until teasers came out. And even then it was like, please don't screw this up. Um, looking at you, part of part, part of season two, Picard. Like, I'm looking at you. Um, but I, like, sight unseen. Like, I'm just like, let's do another 10 right now. Let's go. Hit it. Agreed. <laughs> um, I will say I had planned as a uh, just a single episode at the end of this year for the channel doing a best and worst content of the year. Um, I don't see anything other than maybe season three of Orville pushing this off the top. Mm -hmm. um, I will also That's say... Fair. I have some thoughts on Star Trek this year that I wrote down after watching this episode at the end of this. Um, so if y'all humor me. Please. Um, Strange New Worlds has made us believe we can be better again. To never stop trying and pushing and crossing boundaries. How rare it is to serve on a Starfleet vessel, let alone a ship named Enterprise. With the journey of suffering for a better tomorrow told through Picard Season 2, Discovery Season 4, and Strange New Worlds, 
the card showed us an examination of trauma and the value of consent. Discovery showed us that people will do anything for those they love, for good or ill. Even Prodigy showed us people will do anything, excuse me, showed us that what we think we might want just might be terrible for us in the end. Mm -hmm. What a year it has been to be a Star Trek fan. It has firmly supplanted Star Wars as my number two franchise and might be gaining on the MCU. We'll wait to see how Thor does. They've made us think and ask questions of ourselves and be better because of it. And that is what Star Trek is. Amen. 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 I love it. Yep. I, and as someone that is a fan of, of Star Wars, Star Trek, and the MCU, but in a different order than you, mm -hmm. uh, I am beyond touched uh, that you that Strange New Worlds in particular has helped bring that to you as an experience um, because I like to say that Star Wars um, taught me morals. Star mm -hmm. Trek taught me ethics. Mm. Yeah. And to to have that touch you, have, to have a piece of Star Trek touch you like that, it means a lot to me because Star Trek has been a grounding rod for me since my tweens. Um, every, every bit as much as Star Wars, just on a different facet. So thank you for sharing that. It was absolutely yeah. amazing. Absolutely. Um, I... I just I can't wait for more. Um, Lower deck seems mm -hmm. to be uh, what's up next at bat, and it can't get here quickly enough. Uh, next Thursday right. is going to be very very strange because this is the first time in history that we'd had, I believe they said twenty nine straight weeks of Star Trek on, and um, sometimes multiple episodes in the same week. Multiple episodes in literally the same week. John, same you might week. say it'll be a strange new world. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> I, I live here, so I will. Uh, <laughs> As our producer gives you the thumbs down. Dad jokes it. are a bridge too far, apparently, <clears throat> according to our producer. He Thank stretches you. the cane from like four counties away. And just... <laughs> <laughs> well, I have enjoyed it. And thank you so much for allowing me and all of us, actually, uh, to come into your YouTube and uh, um, and, and come to you week to week with, with this and everything else on the channel. And thank you, Jake, for allowing me to, to take the helm on this on this show and uh, give me a chance to, 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 to uh, stretch my creative abilities a bit. And uh, I cannot wait for the next show to come up. Uh, as I said, it's going to be strange. Uh, Lower Decks. Uh, Lower Decks is going to be coming soon. They haven't given a release date, but it is. they did say this summer. So there's only but so much more time until we're going to see it back. And again, if you haven't seen The Ready Room, the uh, show that, w that Will Wheaton does after each of the episodes of Star Trek, please go back and watch that this week. There is a very funny uh, little clip of, of, uh, of Lower Decks Season 3 to, to get you excited about what's to come. Uh, but again, from all of us here, uh, please uh, thank you so much. Like and subscribe if you've enjoyed what you've had here. Uh, please put a comment in the section if there's anything you want to see that we haven't been doing. Uh, it, it certainly helps us uh, try to cater what we what we offer uh, based on, on what you want. Uh, and just come back with us next time. Again, thank you so much. Have a great day and be safe. Long life and prosperity, all. Hey there, thanks for checking this video out on the Nerd Network. John, what else can they look to offer from the Nerd Network? Well, come back to us every week. Uh, our primary show, uh, Nerd Talk, where Jake and I, and uh, oftentimes a guest, will review and comment on some of the major franchises that matter most to you, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, Star Trek, and many, many more. In addition to that, we have Adventures in Nevermore coming this summer. It is an episodic uh, adventure shown through the lens of Dungeons and Dragons. And I think you'll really, really enjoy that. Uh, in addition, uh, we have From the John's Vault. This is my monthly uh, special where we take a movie that is near and dear to my heart and uh, show it to Jake, who, who is, has not seen it thus far. 
Uh, so it's it's a ton of fun, uh, a nice a little nostalgia burst uh, that comes along all the time. And then every Sunday we have News with the Nerds, our weekly wrap up of the news that matters most. Absolutely. And if you want to connect with any of us, let us know how we're doing or just chat your favorite nerdy franchises because John and I and Jay and Nathan and all the others are always good for a sit down drag out who's going to win Hulk or Thor fight. We got that. So you can connect with me on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, and TikTok at the Jake the Nerd. You can connect with John on Twitter at the John the Nerd. And you can connect with the network itself on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at the Nerd Network to yank the battles out of that. And if you're right here on YouTube, please help us out by doing a subscribe, a like, and ring that bell so you can hear about all the things John just told you about. We'll see you next time right here where all the nerdiness happens. Have a great night. Have a great day and be safe. 